Hi, this is Tabletop Templar, and welcome back to uh, another uh, video of War and Peace. And today I'm going to show you how to play the game, and I'm going to do the introductory scenario that uh, takes place during the Italian campaign of 1796 to 1797. And this uh, scenario was is a new one. This is unique to this particular version of the game and was not uh, present in the uh, the original Avalon Hill game. So this is a new scenario and it's specifically designed as a introductory scenario. John Gant and uh, the other designers uh, designed this scenario to be introductory and there's two different versions of this. There's the introductory scenario and the advanced scenario which adds new rules and new victory conditions and uh, it, it may add a little complexity but uh, I, I'm gonna that's not gonna be what we're gonna cover in today today we're going to cover the just the introductory scenario now at a later time I can come back and do uh, the advanced scenario but for now I want to show everyone how to play this game you know if you just got this new version of War and Peace you know, and you're not really sure how the rules work. Maybe you didn't play the original War and Peace, and you're a little bit confused. Um, I just want to run through and, and play this scenario out. Uh, and, if, and if you already know how to play, hopefully you can just uh, sit back and enjoy this. You know, it's just entertainment. Uh, and you can just kind of watch and see what I do. Uh, I, I make no claim to be you know, an expert on this particular game. I played a lot of the original uh, War and Peace, but since this is a brand new scenario, uh, I've just kind of read through it, and so if I make any strategic errors, I uh, don't, don't uh, criticize me too hard. Um, I'm, I'm, this is the first time I'm playing through this as well. One thing to mention before we get started is even though this is a reissue, or a redesign, I should say, of War and Peace, uh, there is some errata, and it's uh, significant. You're going to want to get a, a copy of this, because it changes uh, some of the uh, uh, the scenarios and really uh, it, it really cleans up some of the errors that unfortunately made it into even the final version of this game. And... Uh, even some of the playing pieces, as I kind of show you some of the things, uh, have been changed. I won't do all of them, but one major uh, change is this particular scenario. Uh, I will show you for the introductory scenario. Um, the, the this is the rata. The reinforcement phase should be used in both basic and advanced versions of the scenario. Um, so, because originally in the rule book, in the scenario book, I should say, it said to skip the reinforcement and the alliance phase. Well, it turns out for the, for the introductory scenario, it turns out that's not uh, correct. According to the errata, uh, you need to play both the reinforcement uh, phases in both versions. Uh, and another issue is that you could see uh, right here. Um, hex p23 to hex p24 uh, <laughs> so in the scenario as written in the uh, scenario booklet uh, both Bonaparte's force and you see this leader Austrian leader here he originally was in the same hex as Bonaparte which led myself and I'm sure many several other players to assume that it meant that there was supposed to be a battle at the very beginning, you know. Uh, you know, this is the introductory scenario. Uh, maybe the designer wanted players to have a taste of battle right off the bat. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case because uh, in the errata, that hex has now been moved one over, uh, actually, to, to Genoa. So now the Austrian... Uh, army uh, is occupying Genoa, which to me makes more sense. Uh, Genoa should probably should not have been 
uh, unoccupied by the Austrians. They would have occupied it. And so it makes the first battle most likely going to be for Genoa itself. Or at least a siege. Uh, so that's a, another major change. I just wanted to mention, if when you are, uh, if you do get a copy of this game, uh, go on Board Game Geek, get the Errata, get this. Uh, it says this is a 3.0 revision, September 1st, 2020. This is the newest uh, Errata, Errata as of the this video. So go and get the get it um it really uh it's it's, it's essential really you're going to want to have it um so just want to add that in and uh we'll get started in the first turn in a minute so i wanted to show everyone the turn sequence uh th this is going to be for um for all the scenarios the french player is always going to go first and it always starts with the attrition phase you to determine attrition, you figure out if they're in supply or not in supply, and then you do attrition. But as you can see in parentheses, uh, it's ignored on turn one, as is the alliance phase. So the alliance phase in this scenario is ignored anyway, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, and for the first turn, uh, it's going to be ignored. Uh, the reinforcement phase will be uh, now be uh, counted because uh, it, for the errata, the errata, I should say, I, it included the, um, the reinforcements. And there are reinforcements. Uh, for these, this, the introductory scenario starts in May of 1790, 1796, I believe. And, oh, my friend. And, um, there is going to be a French reinforcement. So that is significant. And so we are going to start with the reinforcement of uh, Kellerman with some French troops. And then you can see ground movement and then movement and then combat. And then you see anti-French segment and then you advance the turn and then they do everything that in this turn sequence as well. And then yeah, at the end of that, you advance a turn marker. So the thing about War and Peace is you have to understand, um, and it might confuse some players, is that this game is based on either French, you know, pro-French or anti-French, or you're neutral. There is no segment for an individual country to just activate on its own. You're either pro-French or you're anti-French, or you're neutral and you're not active. That's just how the game works. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're playing. I think uh, reading Board Game Geek, some of the questions uh, come up. And uh, I think some of the answers really were, just keep in mind, it's you're pro-French or anti-French. Uh, you're not uh, on your own, you know, doing your own thing. <laughs> you, it just doesn't work in this game. You know, you could probably come up with some kind of... Uh, variant but if, if you are you know just know that you are doing a variant the original intention of this game is you're either with the french or you're against them or you're neutral there's no other you know uh other side that you know spain isn't doing their own thing you know on their own um so just keep that in mind so since uh the attrition phase is the first phase We'll talk about uh, supply for a second, because that's going to be really important in this game, is keeping your army supplied and uh, avoiding attrition is a uh, is really a factor in this game that you're going to want to uh, always keep in mind of which army is in supply and out of supply. And you're going to want to know that at all times because it's a, a unit, an army, is always either going to be in supply or out of supply. And its condition can change the moment it's out of supply or in supply, depending on if it's coming in or out of. So you're always going to want to know how it works. And so we'll talk about that for a second. So 
a unit has to be is considered in supply if it's within uh, three hexes or three or three movement points of a friendly city or a supply city, um, or within three movement points of a friendly unit. So it's possible to build, um, you know, a, a supply chain across the map. You know, if you want to play the the longer, the bigger scenarios, that's how it works. So you would have to leave, you know, a, a friendly unit behind to as a supply depot, which makes complete sense. That's what happened. You know, they had they would leave behind uh, troops to to guard supplies. So, in the introductory scenario, the French supply source is all. Um, for all French units, is any major city in France. So, we can look and see we've got Toulon here. So, this unit is in supply. We have Bonaparte is here. Technically, Genoa is within the border of France in this, how, how this works. But it's currently occupied by the Austrians, so that doesn't count. So Toulon is going to be the supply. So he, so the, both these French armies are in supply. So you've got uh, this. Uh, you've got this army. Is in Turin, which technically is in within the French border, but he's within enough movement points of Milan. So he's in supply. And the Austrians also, according to the scenario, um, yeah, the supply source for any Austrian unit in any, is any major city in Austria. For the purposes of this scenario, the following are considered to be part of Austria, the Kingdom of Italy, which is here. You can see this, uh, the borders around here. This is Italy, but the Kingdom of Italy. It's not all of Italy. Italy was not united at this point. Uh, so you got the Kingdom of Italy, Bavaria, which is all the way up here. This is Bavaria, and Dalmatia. Which, uh, where is Dalmatia? Well, Dal oh, Dalmatia is here. So, it, they're basically going to be in supply mainly from Italy. So, obviously any of these Austrians are within the three movement points of Italy. Um, and then this Austrian army is within, he, he's in supply of Italy. So everyone's in, starting off, they're in supply. So that's the first thing you, you figure out. So everyone's in supply. And then you do attrition. So attrition is based on how many, uh, it was well, ignored in the first turn, but it prevents you from stacking a bunch of you, you know, troops together. So part of the Napoleonic philosophy is, um, you know, move, divided, fight, united. That's kind of what Napoleon really based his, uh, his really, you know, his, his attacking philosophy on, you know, they had the core system. And it, this is, um, it, it's shown in this game as well. It, you don't want to clump up your armies and suffer losses from attrition. Uh, because they can get kind of nasty. And I'll show you the attrition chart. Attrition table, I should say. And uh, there's also another errata I should mention. These should be swapped. The 16 to 20 and 11 to 15, these tables should be swapped. So that's another kind of minor annoyance with this, uh, is that, you know, they're... The tables weren't correct. So this, so this is another point of uh, just look out for. Just swap these two 
uh, 16 to 20, 11 to 15. If you got download the errata sheet, it'll tell you that. Um, so just just uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, you could, I'm sure you could print off probably a, a updated one. Not a huge deal, but you know, my another annoyance with the newer edition. But this is the table, and as you can see, you know, you're gonna if you have three to five, you're not gonna lose any one. Well, if you roll a six, you'll lose one. But there's factors, you know, that will take in, if you're in your home country, um, you know, all French and French satellite units. And that's because the French army would forage. And so they didn't necessarily always need to have a supply line. Uh, it certainly helps, but uh, they were able to forage. And so I think that's that's what the ruling is for that. So if you're in your home country and you got between three to five, well, anything, basically anything five or under, um, you're not going to suffer any attrition. If that army moves out of your home country, or, let's try to steady this, or your stack is larger than that, and if it gets larger, you're going to suffer, more likely to suffer attrition. So, you just want to keep that in mind. And there's other, other um, factors as well. Winter, um, you know, the weather can play a factor. We're not going to do that uh, for this scenario, but because everything takes place pretty much in the same area. So, all right, uh, that's going to be the, uh, the attrition phase. And so we're going to do the... Next would be the alliance phase. I'll show you the alliance phase, and then that's also ignored on the first turn. But this scenario does ignore the alliance phase for sure. It's not errata. The, the errata it doesn't bring it back. It's for sure not covered for the introductory scenario. The alliance phase is covered in the advanced version of this scenario. So if you're doing that. Uh, which includes uh, the additional um, faction of Piedmont, uh, which I actually I'm interested in playing that the advanced one as well. Um, you will be doing the alliance phase, so uh, just to uh, just to let you know. So next is the reinforcement phase. So this scenario starts in May of 1796, and in the reinforcement phase of May 1796, the French are going to get reinforcements. Uh, and so you're going to get at Lyon, uh, you're going to get J uh, Kellerman with three infantry and one cavalry. And that's this force right here. They're going to go right at Lyon. So we got three infantry, one cavalry. And I'm going to get them on the board. So norm, So actually what I do is um, I'll just put the leader and then I'll use the leader uh, display board. So I'll show that in a little bit later, but just uh, know that I off, off camera, I've got the forces on the, the unit, the, uh, the Alliance leader display board. And so that way it shows the board is just the leaders. Now you can play it without all the units in the stacks and then hopefully they won't get knocked over. Um, I'm trying it this way. I might play with the units units on. Maybe I might switch it later on but for now there's some pretty tall stacks so I don't want anything to get knocked over. And the other one the other uh, reinforcement is at Toulon, the French are going to get one infantry. So we'll put that in. There's Toulon. And that, coincidentally, is also one of the victory conditions, which I forgot to mention. So for this introductory scenario, uh, it says France wins automatically if it controls Genoa, Milan, Toulon, uh, Turin, 
and one uh, of these other cities, and the other cities are Mantua, Innsbruck, or Venice. So Toulon is one of those cities they need to hold, and now they've got it. They've, you know, one of, one of five down. Austria wins by denying France their victory conditions. The scenario begins in May 1796, and it ends in September 1796. So each turn is one month, so that's only a, a couple turns. So this, this introductory scenario is not going to last very long. Alright, so the next turn sequence is going to be ground movement. So uh, the French side are going to have a choice here. Uh, what to do? Well, you've got a big force, you've blown apart. Just to show you've got another general, uh, Messena, and then you've got two, well, you've got Angero and a zero leaders. You've got some leaders here. It's a pretty big force, and um, in the display board, I've got this is going, this is a uh, you've got 11 infantry and one cavalry, uh, and you've got Bonaparte. So this is actually, bef so the reason why it's Bonaparte, not Napoleon. Napoleon is a three, uh, a general of three, but this is, this is just two. Well, that's because this, this is before Napoleon has a command staff, and explains this in the rules it's before, you know, he became Napoleon. You know, he was, he start well, he started off, it really is just an artillery lieutenant. And he gained experience. And he, you know, developed his command staff. So he's not quite the Napoleon uh, of the later years yet. This is how he started. And so the designers thought that this might be a good introductory scenario because this is how Napoleon got his start, which is the Italian campaign. So, uh, the French have some choices, in particular Bonaparte. Uh, there's a city here, uh, this is Genoa, and this is a, uh, this is one of the cities they have to take for their victory conditions. So, the, the French need to take this city. So, if they attack, which they're going to, the Austrians have a choice. So we're going to move this force under Bonaparte. And I think we're going to send, I think we're going to send everyone here. No sense of splitting anyone up, really. Um, I think we'll just send this entire force here. I guess we could leave someone behind, maybe a leader zero or something. I'm not really sure what we're going to do with him, but we'll send these three in. And the 11 infantry, one cavalry, will attack Genoa. And to kick things off here. And now the Austrians have a choice. They can either fight, um, they're going to be able to fight the battle as a field battle outside of the city. Or they can go inside the city. Which they're going to do that because uh, this is the Austrian force is four infantry and one cavalry currently at Genoa, so they're badly outnumbered. Uh, so they're going to go inside the city, and now Napoleon is going to have a choice whether or not to assault or besiege, uh, and so. Time is not in Napoleon's favor, or Bonaparte's favor, or Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, the French, I should say. The French, uh, time is not on their side, so they're gonna have, they're gonna probably want to assault. Um, so we'll do, so we'll, combat comes later, so I think that that's what he's gonna do, he's gonna assault, and we're also gonna move Leader H is here. We're going to move him up here and his forces. 
Uh, Leader H has uh, two infantry, one cavalry, and they might be able to come to... Let me double check that, actually. I'm going to see if they can potentially act as reinforcements to this battle. One thing that I, I forgot is that you don't have to actually put... They don't have to enter the same hex. Um, it just have to be adjacent, adjacent. So I moved this force, this French force here, into the same stack as Bonaparte. And, uh, and then they're going to combine and they're going to, uh, attack, uh, Genoa together. So, um, yeah, that was Leader H. I guess I could, uh, I guess I could have moved him. Up here. Well, but then they won't be able to fight together. Yeah, no, they're going to be in the same stack. That's right. So, overthinking this. <laughs> um, so, this is going to be in the same stack as Napoleon. Uh, attrition phase has ended. So, I'll just make sure that they're not going to be stacked all together at the end of the battle. Assuming that he takes Genoa. So, that'll be the first fight. Uh, and so that leaves this unit here is going to stay in Toulon uh, to guard this, and that's also part of the, the victory condition. And so we left is we've got Kellerman at Lyon. So um, the next objective is going to be Turin. That's going to be the other uh, city that they're going to need to take. And Kellerman has a force of three infantry, one cavalry, and at Turin. There is a force of five infantry, one cavalry. So they're going to need to get over there uh, and possibly uh, and try to do something. So they could take this pass through the mountains, through the uh, through Switzerland area. Well, it'd be you know, still technically France. It's just below. Just south of Geneva, according to this map. Um, well, where should they go? They're going to be outnumbered. But they might be able to force these northern Austrian forces to to kind of uh, maybe not come to the aid to south. It might force them to defend the north. So let's do that. Um, so how a movement works is... Infantry always have to be accompanied by a leader, and the infantry can only move a maximum of three movement points. Cavalry uh, can move farther, so but since there's um, in in, in uh, cavalry can move uh, four, and leaders can move up to ten on their own, but if they're carrying other units then they have to abide by the you know whatever movement points that they're uh, accompanying so it's going to be three so we're going to go one and i want to double check on the movement chart for the pass because some of these are kind of new so the mountain pass i'm going to double check so according to the mountain pass rules, since this has a, uh, it has a line to it, it's called a mountain pass. So it says the unit expends one movement point to enter a mountain hex through either one of the hex sides connected by the mountain pass line. So if you go along here, uh, you, you can just expend one movement, which is the minimum. So that could be... That could be a good move. So we'll go one, two, three, and Kellerman will go right there, and he'll be uh, right north of Turin. So he'll be able to threaten the Austrians and maybe get them to think twice before coming, going south. So I think that's going to be a, it's a kind of a risky move for Kellerman, but um, you know they you got to be aggressive here. They don't, the French don't have a lot of time, so so we're going to do uh, French combat. 
So remember, we go going back to the turn sequence. Um, you go, you do all this for the French side. So it's this system is I go, you go. So as a French player, you do everything first. So you do movement, combat, and and then the anti-French player does everything else. So you're going to resolve combat now. So the French are going to attack. Bonaparte is going to attack uh, Genoa. So you've got these two forces are going to do battle. So here's the decision. The Austrians could stand and fight as a field battle. They're not going to do that. They're going to go inside the city. So now the French have a decision to make. They can either um, besiege the city, which over time can grind them down and get them to surrender, or they can assault the city. Well, the French don't have a lot of time, and they need to take the city quickly. So I think they're gonna they're gonna assault the city, which is gonna make basically function as a field battle in, in a lot of ways. It'd be a city assault. But the strength of each unit inside the city is doubled when determined combat odds. And any unit that possesses a basic morale of zero is considered to have a morale of one. Uh, and then you don't modify any terrain effects or entrenchments when you're in doing a city assault. So uh, Bonaparte, uh, they're going to just assault the city here. Uh, they've got a combined force of 13 infantry and 2 cavalry. So it's a pretty good force and uh, fighting that is going to be 4 infantry, 1 cavalry. But we double that. So while that would have been, that would be 5 it's now a 10 so it's going to be a little bit more on the even side still going to be uh, French outnumbering them so the combat odds you take the uh, let's find the odds here where is it Okay, here we go. The combat there we go, results table. So here the, there's only three odds. It's one to one, three to two, or two to one and up. Two to one is the best. And that's it. And so we're gonna uh, we'll do the first battle here, the city assault on Genoa. So we've taken the total French uh, strength points is 15 divided by 10 because there's five strength points, but they're doubled. So that's for the Austrians, we get 10. So it comes to 1.5. So if the result, uh, and this is in the rule book, if the result of this division is two or greater, the odd ratio is two to one. If the result is less than two, but equal to or greater than one and a half, the odds result, odds ratio is three to two. So it's going to be a three to two odds. So, so that's now we know our odds. So now we determine uh, some of the modifications. So one of them is going to be the morale. So we take the morale of the Austrians. And we compare it to the morale of the French. So I'm going to take two, and hopefully you can see them. Uh, you've got, well, I don't know if you can see that, but, but the French uh, infantry and French cavalry are a morale of two. The Austrians is a morale of one. So you take the, the number of the... Um, 
the majority. So if well, all of the Austrians have a morale of one, and that's based on, on the stars on the, above their flag on the top left-hand corner of their um, of the counter. And so if it has a one star, it's one morale. Zero star is zero morale. But since it's uh, a, a city assault, if they have zero, they would get one morale. But all the Austrians have one morale already, so they don't get additional one. It just means if you have zero, then they would get one. Um, and then the French infantry, that these are just basic French infantry, have two morale. And the French cavalry have two. Um, so the each army has the same morale for this scenario, but other scenarios might be different. So say you've got most of the your infantry or most of your force might have two morale or maybe one morale, but you've got a couple units that have two morale. So whichever is the most, uh, use that morale to determine uh, it's it's base morale. So uh, we've got uh, the French of two and the Austrians of one. So we're going to be adding one to this die roll. And then we determine the leadership rating. So we have Bonaparte as the two leader. And let me take this battle. We have the leader zero is, well, zero rating. So we're going to add another two. So we're going to adding a three to this total. And we're going to compare it on this combat results table. And we're going to be at 3 to 2 odds. So I'm going to roll. And we'll see what we get. We got a 5 out of 1. We're going to be adding 3 to that. On 3 to 2 odds. Um, let's see. Yep, just wanted to make sure. Yep, here it is. So we, um, so six plus three is nine. So we've got on the three to two, we've got a nine. So that's going to be a larger force lose one. Smaller force lose D1. D stands for demoralize. So we're going to see what uh, that what the losses are. So for, we know for sure the Austrians are going to have one demoralized. So this is basically a French victory, or at least the initial um, this fight. And so we do the strength points of the smaller force. So always determine that. So let me check and see if this matters for the city assault. So yeah, the uh, the for the strength points is going to be ten for the smaller force. That's the Austrians. So you can see we have ten, and the French are going to lose one because that's the the one here. That's their result, and the Austrians have a D one, so they're going to lose two. So this is a two to one loss for the. Austrians and the French. So I'm going to take one away from the French and one away from the Austrians. And it also says if you lose a D, you're going to have to, it has to be from your, um, from your cavalry. So I'll remove the Austrian cavalry. Okay. So sorry about that. Let me, uh, so I just want to, show you how that worked but um it's basically not going to end well for the austrians because there's a, another rule at the end of any combat round a force inside a city which was assaulted during the current combat round is eliminated if its current morale value is zero such units surrender in the grand campaign scenario well, we're not doing a grand campaign so there, there's no we're not taking any prisoners here um and it's an exception if if all of the opposing assaulting strength points have either withdrawn from that field battle or have been eliminated in combat, the inside force is not eliminated. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, so that doesn't apply. So essentially, the Austrians get the D1 demoralized. Well, their morale is only one, so they go to zero. So, and, and they're in a siege, or a city assault, I should say. So now, they basically all surrender. Uh, we're not doing prisoners, but the entire force is destroyed. So, that's a pretty big victory. And they're able to destroy four units of infantry in one Austrian cavalry to the loss of one French uh, infantry. So that's a, yeah, that's a pretty big start. And the leader is also destroyed. Or he's uh, dead. So that was the Battle of uh, Genoa. So now Bonaparte has taken Genoa. And they're going to have to try to decide what to do about this. So Bonaparte's going to take Genoa here. And that's another city that they needed. So we've got Messina here. He's just as good. He's the two as well. But he's not... Uh, he's not terrible. But one other thing we need to do is we need to roll for uh, after each battle. Any, every leader that participated in that battle, we have to roll for casualties, potential casualties. So basically we have to roll, and if you get double sixes, then uh, then they can be injured or killed. So we'll roll for Bonaparte first. And that's not a double six, it's that. So we'll do Messina. I'll try to just get through this. Oh, that's close. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Almost. So we'll do... Andro. Andro. Nope. Leader. Um, I, don't, I can't remember if these guys can get killed or not. I think they might. Let's just roll for them. And Leader H is underneath... No, so everyone survives. Everyone's there. So now I'm going to stick uh, a liter zero underneath here just because. And uh, we'll try to figure out what forces need to be split because we don't want to stack everyone together. Because next turn is attrition. So. I'm thinking. I want to have a large force with. Bonaparte. But I want to split this one up. See this next. This Austrian force here is. Uh, we've got leader E. We've only got two Austrians there. So. Probably could have, they could have swung around and uh, split off, but let's, uh, I'll do it, I'll do it um, off camera. So I've split the forces, I've given Messena uh, five infantry to one cavalry, so Bonaparte has uh, seven infantry and one cavalry. I, you know, I'll give Bonaparte, I mean, they're the same uh, leadership value. So there, there's no particular rule that says Bonaparte has to, you know, play a big, bigger role. Technically, you could just have Bonaparte sit back and Messina could do everything. Uh, it's, it wouldn't be very historical, but, you know, you could do that because he has the same, he doesn't have any, any other rule. Uh, the only thing he could he could do is uh, he can move it slightly faster but that's it so that's going to be it for the French I believe uh, they've captured one of their well now two of their objectives and we'll, we'll do the Austrian turn next 
So the Austrians are going to get a replacement in Munich each turn. So we're going to go ahead and put that one infantry in Munich. Uh, and so they're going to get them. It's Munich is not a, um, a objective for the French. So it's just going to be there for a leader to come pick up. So since they've lost troops, they are going to get, they do get that one infantry back. Now, is it going to make much of a difference? Maybe not, but it is there. So I think what the Austrians are going to start doing is Leader H here is going to drop its troops right here in Milan. And Leader H is going to spend its movement points. One, two, three. Uh, that is a high mountain. So it's three movement points of 10. So one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. He's gonna. He's got enough movement to go up there. In. Uh, let me just show you. Real quick, where he's at. He's up there in Munich, so he's gonna go up in Munich, and he's gonna stay there probably for a turn or two, and pick up some of those replacements. So I just wanted to show everyone where he's at and where he's going. So he's going to do that. This cavalry is going to spend its points to move over to here to this force. I'll uh, I'll put this off off the board. So that mo brings this. Uh, Bailu, Bailau is going to be at five, six, he's going to have seven, he's got five infantry and two cavalry now, and he's going to attack Kellerman, he's going to attack Kellerman here, it's a risky attack, but if he can take him out, uh, he can really put pressure on Bonaparte and the French, this cavalry here, he's going to move uh, where is he going to go? Uh, these are low hills. These are, so cavalry of movement of four. So he's going to move right into here to leader E. And that's going to bring his strength up to one infantry and two cavalry. Uh, and then they're going to defend. They're just going to defend here. Uh, we'll see if uh, is that really a good move? Let's see. Let's let's see. Maybe take that back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I I, th I feel like there's got to be a better. He's got to move up. See, Milan's gonna be a target. He's got to get o over here. I'm thinking he's got to get to Mantua. Or Venice. Let's take these. So the one, two, three, four. I think the cavalry is going to go to Mantua instead. And then leader E, he's got to get out of there because he's going to get attacked. So he's got he's got infantry with him. So he can only take going to move three. So he's going to one, two, and yeah, he could do the same. So he's going to move here. This force is going to become Leader E's force. And they're going to go to Mantua instead. I think that's a better decision than staying in the hills. Um, Mantua is a target. And uh, I think they're going to, that's going to be the move they're going to make. So that's going to be the Austrians. And we've got the battle here. And so... We're going to calculate the force here. We've got the Austrians have five, six, seven points. The Kellermans got two, three, four. So 
So 7 divided by 4 is 1.75. And that's going to be... Let me double check. Let me just see what, what odds that's going to be. Just want to double check. It's been a little while since I played. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be 3 to 2 odds again. So we've got the Austrians are attacking at 3 to 2. Um... The morale is going to be, we're going to be subtracting a 1 because of the morale, Austrian morale is 1 less than the French morale. So we're at minus 1. And we're going to be subtracting another one because Kellerman has a, uh, a plus 1 if they were attacking. Now it's minus 1. So we're going to be uh, doing minus 2. For the Austrian roll. Well, this might <laughs> this might not be a good idea. Let's let's see. So how what we got for terrain? That'd be another minus two. We'd be at a minus four for the roll. Um Well, let's let's do it. This might be silly. You can laugh at me for this decision, but let's just do it. Let's see what happens. Minus oh, that's not a good roll. We got six. Minus four is two. So let's do our combat results. That might have been a bad move. But is, we're learning the game for those. So we're at 3 to 2. That's a 2. <laughs> Larger force, D2 demoralized. Smaller force is a 1. Um, you know what? I, I think that was a pretty bad... I didn't realize it was going to be that much. Let's go ahead and just cancel that battle. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think that, that, was a, that would be pretty devastating for the Austrians... To do that. But they're just going to sit there in Turin. I didn't realize it was going to be that badly. So there you go. That's what would have happened. It would have been pretty ugly for the Austrians. If they did that. So I think that's going to be it for the Austrians. And so that's going to be the end. Uh, of that turn. So going back to the turn sequence. So the anti-French player, they do the same. Uh, there was no battle there, so we're not doing casualties. So the last thing is we advance the turn marker, which is, I'll pan up so you can see it. Uh, a little bit higher. There it is, all the way up here. The turn markers. So uh, I will advance them. And um, and it will be the end. Will be the next turn. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this particular video at this turn. Um, I'll go back. I, I feel like uh, this has gone on a little bit longer than I wanted to. So um, I'm gonna have this video be the um, the turn one and kind of how to play, and then I'm gonna do another video where I'll just go ahead and. Uh, play through the rest of the scenario so everyone can see the conclusion. Um, there's only a couple more turns left. So I won't be explaining things as much. I'll just, just kind of play through it. So hopefully this was uh, helpful and beneficial to anyone who's interested in this game. Or if they had any, if, and if you have any questions um, or rules about, uh, you know, the errata or just the, the rules, feel free to put in the comments. And uh, as always, you know, if you go on and like this video, you know, click the like button, subscribe, and uh, and comment. Let me know what you think. All right, this is Tabletop Templar. Take care.